Hello there. Um, my name is Barney Della. I am a software team lead at Canon Medical, based in Edinburgh. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about strong types in C++. I'll be going over what they are, how to use them, and most importantly, why they are useful. So if I'm going to talk about strong types and strong typing in C++, first of all, we need to know what a strong type is. And to answer that, we really need to know what a type is in the first place. We often talk about types in software, but what actually is a type? Well, a type is a way of organizing data and functionality. And a type system is a set of rules for organizing these types, for specifying how we can convert from one type to another, and when or if we do any checking on what kind of types we're using. And C++ is, at least in part, an object-oriented language. And we define classes to represent our data. And we often think of types as being the same thing as classes. And of course, we also have the, the native built-in types, such as float, int, bool, that kind of thing. So let's have a look about at how we use types in programming. And I'm going to start with a look at JavaScript. Now, JavaScript is a dynamic language, and it's weakly typed. There isn't really any agreement in the industry about what we mean by weak or strong typing. But by any definition, JavaScript is not strongly typed. Now, because JavaScript is a dynamic language, it has dynamic typing. So I can make x an integer, and then a string, and then a float, and that's just fine. The type of x changes dynamically as the program is running. And here's another example which shows how JavaScript is weakly typed. Notice the parameters to this function. Um, we don't need to specify a type for them. This function just takes in two values and adds in a comma between them. So here, two strings are passed in. We add in the comma, and then we return the resulting string. And this prints out x, comma, y, as you would hope. And what happens if we pass in, say, two integers to our function? How do you add a comma to an integer? Does anybody here know what this actually does in JavaScript? Indeed, it's 1, comma, 2. It's JavaScript. It just works. You can generally do anything with any type in JavaScript, and it just kind of works. So let's move on to Python. Python is another dynamic language, but unlike JavaScript, Python is often described as being strongly typed. So in Python, again, like in JavaScript, the typing is dynamic. So I can make x an integer, a string, a float, and that all just works. That's fine. Let's look again at that function. So again, we don't need to specify the types for the parameters to the function. We just take in the two values in. Uh, we add the comma between them. Uh, and here we're passing in two strings, x and y. We add the comma and then return the resulting string. And again, this prints out x, comma, y. And here we are in Python, passing in two integers. We try and add the comma to the first integer and then add the second integer on again. And does anybody know what this does in Python? Indeed, this throws an exception. It fails at runtime because we used the wrong type. <laughs> and if we want to guard against this, we would need to add in a check on the type of the input, or put in a try accept block, and then have unit tests to make sure that's all working properly. So Python is, in some ways, a weakly typed language. We can write an API that allows us to pass in the wrong type, and there is no checking before runtime. And interestingly, this is actually a feature, not a defect, of languages like Python and JavaScript. Because you don't have to think about the types or the type system. You can develop small programs very quickly. And JavaScript was developed for this very purpose. However, this causes problems with larger programs. After a point, the program becomes too big and too complicated to keep in our heads. And the lack of type safety makes it more likely that we'll call an API that we shouldn't and get a runtime crash. 
Now, JavaScript is obviously used on large-scale projects these days. And now we're seeing developments such as TypeScript, which add typing to the language. And Python 3 allows you to optionally specify the types as inputs to functions. But this is a C++ conference. So let's have a look at that same problem again, uh, but this time in C++. So here we have a function that takes in two parameters. But this time, they are two strings. And we add them together with a comma in between them. And then the function also returns a string. Great. And if we call it, as before, we get x, comma, y. All good so far. But what happens if we try and pass in integers this time? Does anyone know what happens if we try and run this? Hmm? It does not compile. We get a compilation error. You can't run this code. The program is ill-formed and cannot be compiled. So the compiler has added a level of testing to our code, meaning that we don't need to remember the meaning of the API. It's encoded in a way that the machine understands so that we don't have to. So fantastic. C++ is a strongly typed language. And that was the real goal of my talk. So in some ways, we're done. <laughs> and when, well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So when I first talked to Phil about doing this talk, there was some confusion. I thought I was doing a lightning talk. But then he told me that I had an hour. I thought I'd try and stretch it out a bit by adding in some JavaScript and Python, but it didn't quite work. So I have prepared some filler material. Um, this doesn't really work on the dark screen, but this is the constellation Orion. Um, which I'm a big fan of. Um, I like a lot of astronomy. Um, I even have a Ryan tattoo just here on my arm. Um, and it's only really visible in winter. It hangs low in the southern sky. And it's one of the reasons I love living in Scotland, because you can see it quite well. These are photos um, of the actual surface of Titan, one of the moons around Saturn. Um, that's actually a close-up of rocks on the surface of Titan, taken by the Huygens lander, which was dropped by the Cassini probe a while back. Um, there are actually lakes and rivers on Titan made of methane and ethane, and both the European Space Agency and NASA have planned to send yachts there to sail on them, which is brilliant. This is Mars, um, and I love the fact that we've got robots there right now which are sending out photos. This is an actual photo of Mars taken by the Curiosity rover. This is another one. I just find these pictures absolutely amazing. This is a picture of the Curiosity rover itself, just doing its thing on Mars. It's been there for years now. And just recently, there was an announcement that an actual water lake had been detected under the southern Martian pole. Now, Curiosity, the rover we just saw, is in the Gale crater, which is quite a long way from the pole. But there had been a plan a couple of decades ago to send a lander to the pole, supported by the Mars Climate Observer. What happened to that? So I did a bit of Googling, and yep, there had been a plan. And this, here it is, this is the Mars Climate Observer, and it crashed into the surface of Mars. And it turns out that it crashed because of a software error, which is interesting. The orbiter cost $328 million, and it was destroyed by software. Hmm. Now, I write medical software, so serious failures caused by badly written software is always interesting to me. I did a bit of research just to see why the lander crashed. You know, what kind of bug was it that caused it to crash into Mars? And this was an interesting headline in one of the articles I read. The metric system has been used by NASA for many years. Now, of course, the US still mostly uses the imperial system, feet and inches, that kind of thing. Um, in the US, the imperial system is even used in mainstream science. Hmm. So I dug a bit deeper. It turns out that NASA wrote code that was using metric units. But they outsourced some of the software to Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin used imperial units. And these two pieces of code interacted with each other. Now, I didn't find the actual code. Um, but basically, the outsourced code calculated the impulse to be used to control the angular momentum. Now, NASA wrote a document called the Systems Interface Specification, which said that the result should be in Newton seconds. But Lockheed Martin were used to using pound-four seconds. And so 
That's what they returned from their code. And, well, the orbiter went way too close to Mars and crashed. But I thought I said just now that C++ was strongly typed. I thought we had compiler support for this kind of thing. So what happened? The trouble is that the impulse is stored as a double. Whether it's in Newton seconds or pound four seconds, it's still just a double. The type of Newton seconds is double. The type of pound four seconds is double. They are the same type. Now, we could obviously write unit tests for this, and that would definitely have helped maybe catch the problem. But then we're back to the same problem we had in Python, where we have to write tests because the compiler isn't there to catch us and catch our mistakes for us. Now, I said before that types are a way of collecting data and functionality together. But they are so much more than that. Types end up being compiled away. They don't exist in assembler or machine code. And like so many features of high-level languages, types are there to help us. High-level languages make it easier for us to understand what our code is doing. And a type system helps us to understand our own code. Types encode meaning. The software that we create these days is vast and complex, and we need all the help that we can get to understand it. So when we see a function like this, what meaning can we extract from it? We would hope it calculates a force. It probably takes in a mass. And those values are expressed as high-precision floating point values. So we know how the numbers are stored, but we don't know what they represent. We don't know what they mean. Should the mass be in kilograms, in ounces, in grams or pounds? And the force that's returned, is that in newtons or pound force? Wouldn't it be nicer if we had an API like this instead? We pass in a value in kilograms, and we get back a value in newtons. This tells us what the values are, not just how they are stored. And more importantly, the compiler sees these as different types. It would see the Newton as a different type to pound force, and the kilogram as a different type to the pound. So if we try and pass in values of the wrong type, we would get a compilation error. So what are these types? We you know what they mean, but how do we encode them? Under the hood, we want them all as floating point numbers. So we'd probably use double. And the obvious way to achieve this in C++ is to use a type alias. So with this line here, we have a type called kilogram that is stored internally as a double. Great. We can do the same thing for pound, and now we have two distinct types. So if we write code like this, it shouldn't compile. Calculate force takes in a value in kilograms, and we're passing in pounds. But this does compile. And of course, that's because kilogram and pound are not different types. They're just pseudonyms for double. So this hasn't solved our problem at all. We need something more sophisticated. So instead, we could create a new type, wrapping up our internal double. We could construct it with a double and there's an accessor. We could add in const versions of all these as well. And then we can do a similar thing for pound. And now we definitely have two distinct types. So let's have a quick look at them. There they are side by side, and they are almost the same. They are so similar that we should probably use a template to create them instead. So we could also abstract away the double that we're using as a template parameter so that we can use our template for things that use other types like, say, int or whatever. So here's the template. Strong type is templated on the underlying type. And we need to add in more functions again to support const access, et cetera. But this is a, a good skeleton version. Uh, this is, uh, just so you know, based on Jonathan Bakara's very good fluent CPP blog um, and GitHub. I'll give you links to that at the end. So now we can use our template like this. We're saying that kilogram is a strong type with an underlying value of type double. And then we can do a similar thing to define pound, except now kilogram and pound are synonyms again. They're both synonyms for strong type templated on double. So we're back where we were just now. Rather than, yeah. But how do we solve this? 
we need to use another parameter into this template, not just the double, to distinguish the two types. We want to parameterize strong type. And in C++, we do that with another template parameter. So we need to use a type that's unique across the whole program. So we can do something just like this. We declare a new type, in this case, kilogram parameter. Uh, and we use that as the second template parameter. And note that we don't use phantom tag in our definition at all. It's just a phantom type, which is there to distinguish one type from another. So now we can create a similar definition for pound. And now, kilogram and pound are genuinely different types. And we have this nice reusable template to boot. And we can even go one better. We can declare the phantom type in line like this. So now we can create a unique, strong type with a well-defined underlying representation in just one line. Sorry, I put the important bits at the bottom where they're really hard to read for everyone at the back. Sorry about that. OK, so now we've got a really nice way of creating unique types that wrap simple types in C++. We can encode meaning nicely and in a way that the compiler understands. Kilogram and pound are both stored as doubles, but they are distinct types. And that gives us two advantages. The compiler will recognize these types as different types and thus catch potential bugs for us. And the types have meaning making it easier for us to reason about and understand our code. OK, so now we have this nice type called kilogram. And wouldn't it be nice if we could add in support for, say, grams and milligrams in a meaningful way? I'll show you how to do that. So this is an example using Studchrono from the standard library. Print seconds here takes in a value in seconds. But in the main function, we're passing in a value in hours. And yet, somehow, the value gets magically converted into seconds by the time it reaches the function body. The standard template library offers a nice mechanism for describing ratios between things, which is std ratio. This here is a ratio of 3 to 2. And std chrono uses this ratio, a std ratio of 60, which is the same thing as 60 to 1. It just, uh, the second parameter just defaults to 1. So let's go back to our definition of strong type. We're going to add in a new template parameter representing a ratio. So there, we have a new parameter. But how are we going to use it? We can simply define a base unit with a ratio of 1 to 1, and then define other units as multiples of that base. So in other words, it would be really nice if we could write something like this. Gram is our base unit, and so it has a ratio of 1. And then kilogram has a ratio of 1,000 to 1, which is what std kilo represents. <coughs> and notice that the two types use the same phantom tag and the same underlying type. They're almost the same type. It's only the ratio that's different. So we need a conversion function that can convert from one type to another. And this is quite easy. We just define an operator within our type uh, that converts from one type to another. And this function then goes into the definition uh, of strong type. It describes how to convert from one type to another as long as they have the same underlying type and the same phantom tag, but a different ratio. And yeah, this will only compile if the type has the same phantom parameter type. So then we don't end up converting, say, meters to grams, but we can convert meters to kilometers or grams to kilograms. But this scheme only works if you remember to put the std ratio of 1 in the base unit. And this is a bit cumbersome, and it's definitely boilerplate, which we have to write each time. So we can solve this by renaming our strong type template to strong type impl, and then writing an alias for strong type, which just uses a std ratio of 1 for us. And then we can create a similar template for multiple of. And this then allows us to write definitions like this. So in two lines, we have two new types, where kilogram is 1,000 grams. But we can go a step further. There is a simple linear ratio for converting between pounds and kilograms. So we could write a converter that allows pounds and kilograms to be used interchangeably, but correctly. 
The exact ratio is 56,699 to 125,000. But with this, we can create a new type called pound, which is a distinct type from kilogram. But if we pass it to a function expecting kilograms, then the compiler will convert it for us into kilograms. This is even better than a compilation error. Instead, we get compiled conversion. Now, I'm going to put those ratios to side for just one minute. The strong types that we've created so far are all well and good, but they do hide away the underlying value. Is that a problem? Well, if we want to add two grams together, we need to get the underlying doubles with the get method, add them, and then create a new gram from the result. And this might not be a problem the first time you write it, but uh, it does become annoying if you need to do it a lot. But I think there's a bigger problem in a sense. It forces the user, the reader of this code, to understand how grams are defined under the hood. In order to add two grams, I need to call get, get both doubles, add them, call a constructor that takes the resulting double. That's a lot of cognitive load for just adding two things together. Wouldn't it be nicer if we could just write code like this instead? It's cleaner, less cluttered, and it doesn't require, require the reader to think about the details. And of course, it's not just addition. We would like multiplication, division, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to be able to select which types of operations we expose. So for kilograms, we probably don't want to allow multiplication, for example. So wouldn't it be nice if we could create some sort of skill that our strong type could inherit from? So we could say that gram is addable, or gram is subtractable. And we want to put the adding logic into that base class. But this generic base class would need to know about the underlying type, in this case, double, in order to perform the operation. It would be really nice if we could write something like this. <laughs> so we can say that, uh, just put all the skills at the end, so here we're saying gram is addable and subtractable. But how does this base class know how to do this? This is a job for the curiously recurring template pattern. Uh, this pattern allows us to create a base class that knows about the derived class. I'll show you how that works. So strong type here at the bottom. Uh, this has come out far too small maybe to read. Mm, oh well. Uh, this inherits from addable. Addable is templated on the type of the strong type. And addable, in turn, inherits from the CRTP base class. CRTP is then templated on the strong type and it then provides a cast back to the underlying strong type. Addable can then use this cast to create a plus operator. And this operator, in turn, is then inherited by strong type. So strong type now has a plus operator, which can add doubles together, or whichever type you've used for your underlying type. So we can then create a bunch of different skills um, for our types, like this. Here we have addition, subtraction, multiplication. And addable uses the plus operator on the underlying type. Um, subtraction uses the minus operator, and so on. We can make our types comparable, like this. Uh, this skill defines all of the operators we need for comparison. And I'm looking forward to the spaceship operator, which is coming in C++20. This will be one line after that. So, Making a type printable is slightly more complicated. You can make a skill quite easily uh, with a useful print function, which prints the underlying type into a stream. But we don't really want to call print. We want to be able to just drop our types into a stream. But to do that, we need to declare the stream operator outside of a class. So we need some sort of function like this for the stream <coughs> operator, declared outside of the class. It takes in the stream and an instance of the strong type, which we want to print. But what goes inside that function? Well, we've already defined that. We can just call the print function from the printable base class. And if the type doesn't implement printable, then this won't compile. And if it does, then it will just be called by the stream operator. So now we can place our strong types into a stream as long as it implements printable. The print function in printable gets called, and that in turn places the underlying type into the stream. And this only works because strong type itself inherits from printable 
as well as Adible and all the rest. But yes, a strong type currently inherits from all of these itself. Wouldn't it be nicer if we could write code like this, as I showed before? We know how to create these skills, addable and subtractable. Um, but we want to take them out of the strong type base class itself. So how do we write strong type so that it can inherit from multiple arbitrary skills? Well, with variadic inheritance, this is quite easy. Firstly, strong type uses variadic templates. It's templated on the underlying type, the phantom tag, and then a variadic list of skills to implement. Strong type then inherits from those skills in a variadic way. Each skill is templated on the strong type. This is the same thing we saw with addable a while ago, but now with a variadic template. And then the inheritance is done for each skill. <coughs> so strong type ends up inheriting from every skill in the list. This kind of syntax, the dot, 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 bracket, bracket, dot, 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 used to terrify me when I first saw it. So uh, don't worry if it terrifies you as well. <laughs> but there we go. Strong type now inherits each skill, if any, which is listed in the template. So here we have x type, which is both addable and subtractable, and y type, which is only multipliable. I'm aware those are terrible names, especially after Kate's talk this morning. OK, um, I'll show you another nice feature which we can add in. It's quite easy to create user-defined literals for these new types. Uh, they're quite easy to define and allow us to write nice code like this. When I first presented this, I managed to get the wrong signature for the uh, thing there. This only works for unsigned long long and unsigned long double and a few other random things for some reason. So. Now we can easily create a value in grams like that. We can just say three grams, and it works. And we can go further and create kilograms and pounds from grams. These will use the nice ratios which we defined earlier on. So here k will be what 0 0.01 grams, or no 0 0.01 kilograms. And of course we could also create user-defined literals for kilogram and pound, like this. OK, there was quite a lot in all that, so I'll just have a quick look at what we can do with all of that code that uh, we've just been through. We can define a base type, in this case, the gram. This is addable and printable. Kilograms and pounds are then defined as multiples of that base type. And then we give each of those a literal definition. Our function, print mass in grams, takes in a value in grams and prints it as you'd expect. Uh, we can then call it by adding together a value in kilograms and another value in pounds, and we get the right result. And that's all the code you need to do that, as long as you've got the strong type defined. Yeah? Uh, so you can do nonlinear relations as well. That's still a linear relationship, isn't it? Yeah. But it's not a ratio. So yeah, you can still manage that. You just make a slightly more complicated conversion function for your operator. You can also handle nonlinear relationships as well, like um, decibels and watts, for example. You just need to write a more complex function than just dividing one ratio by another. OK, that was uh, a fair bit of detail. Um, and my throat's quite dry. Of course, every slide deck really should have some cats in it, and there's been a shocking lack of them so far at this conference. Um, these are my two cats, Hector and Honey. Um, as my wife said, we should have a small pause. <laughs> so, uh, just gonna have some water. You can admire the cats. Okay, I'm gonna show you a couple of real world use cases now. Um, the first one is from my production code, and it uses the strong type library, which uh, we've just been through. Uh, and the second one is an internal library, which I'm working on. So for a feature I worked on recently, we were looking at incremental slices of data through the body. Um, something like this, only with medical imaging data rather than bread. So 
Each slice has a thickness, and there is a set increment between each slice. Uh, we were writing some code which was going to take sample slices through the data at fixed increments and produce some new output. Um, I work on a very large legacy code base, uh, and this feature was an extension to an existing feature which went through the code base. So I needed a lot of code that looked a bit like this. Some values representing a set of steps came out of the user interface and were passed down into an algorithm to generate some data. And the thickness and increments were both doubles, and to make matters worse, they were normally quite similar numbers. So if we passed in the numbers the wrong way around, and we did, then it was not easy to spot. The code compiled, the code ran. If we looked at the debug logs, the numbers looked OK because the numbers were so similar, but we got an incorrect result. It's very easy to call this within the wrong way around. But more than that, you need to read the types and the parameter names to understand what the API is. And it can get even worse. What if you have the names in a different order in the header and the CPP files? We did this. This will happily compile. And if you read the API in the header, you'll think you understand the API. And the person who is implementing it thinks they understand it. That took us ages. Now, obviously, I could create a struct like this to hold the values, and that definitely is a step forwards. It raises the level, uh, level of abstraction of the code, and it keeps the values together. But you could still pass in the wrong ones into the constructor of the struct itself. So we created strong types for all three using the strong type library. And now the API looks like this. It's meaningful. It's type safe. And it's much closer to the problem domain. It's all much cleaner. So in some cases, we still have functions like this. But before we use strong types, you need to know the names of the variables as well as their types. You maybe even needed comments to see what the variables represented. Now, we don't need names of the variables for the parameters in the header file. The types tell you what you need to know. This code here is all you need to have in the header file. And of course, the types tell the compiler that as well. They tell the compiler that thickness and increment are different types. If we accidentally pass them in the wrong way round, we won't have to waste time debugging. The code will not compile in the first place. We have completely removed a potential source of defects. OK, this next use case doesn't actually use the strong type library that we've been looking at. Um, but instead, I adopted the same principles for a slightly more fiddly problem. But it does highlight the power of strong types. So in my work, we do a lot of 3D geometry. We deal with 3D scans of patients, and we have coordinate spaces defined for the original scan data, for the patient, for the viewing plane. And we have transformations defined for converting between those various different spaces. And this allows us to, say, mark a, a point on some anatomy in the patient, and then view it from different viewing angles. So here we have a point on the patient's sternum, um, and we want to see the same point on the view. But if we pan or zoom the CT image, uh, we want the red dot to stay on the sternum, because it represents a point on the, in that place in the patient. But we want the point on the view to move as the image is panned. So it the red dot should do that. So we have an old class in our code called a vector. And it is used to represent a vector or a point in a 3D space. And it's defined by three coordinates, x, y, and z. And this can be used to define a location or a direction, and the class has everything you might need for a point or a vector. You can add them, subtract them, normalize them, cross them, dot them, that kind of thing. And we have another class representing a transformation matrix, which allows us to transform points um, or to transform 3, 3, a vector. Transform 3, 3 uh, ignores the translation part of the matrix and just applies the rotation and scaling, because a vector just represents a direction. And finally, of course, we have a manager class, because every system needs a manager class. This provides the matrix um, as long as you can provide the spaces to convert from and to. And this allows us to write code like this. P patient and Q patient are points. PQ patient is the vector from P patient to Q patient. P view 
has been transformed into a different coordinate space, into view space. And because P patient is a point, we use transform and not transform 3, 3, and vice versa for PQ patient. I think that's right. Should it be transform 3, 3 for PQ patient? Yes, PQ patient is a vector, not a point, so that's the right way around. But we could just as easily swap those two calls around, and it would still work. The result is now meaningless, but the compiler doesn't know that, and we'll get a result. So, P patient, Q patient, and P view are points. PQ patient and PQ view represent vectors. Some of these are in one coordinate space, and some are in another. And the compiler knows nothing about any of that. It's clearly right for someone to use the wrong transformation or to use a vector as a point or to add a vector from one space to a point in another. I mean, what is this broken vector here? We're adding a point in patient space to a vector in view space. It doesn't make any sense to add a point to a vector in the first place, and it makes even less sense when they're not even in the same coordinate space. It's like we're trying to add the sternum to down the screen. That shouldn't work, but it does. It compiles, it runs, it has a value, it's got x, y, and z coordinates, but those numbers are just meaningless. This kind of code could easily slip into production code and give us garbage values. And then you have great fun trying to debug what's happened. And also, because there is no distinction between one coordinate space and another, the magnitude of any vector is just a double. We have some nice helpers like dot and cross and norm for acting on vectors, but those same functions are also available for points. But what is the magnitude of a point? It doesn't have one. So, we have a lot of confusion between a point in a 3D space, a vector in a 3D space, and between which space all of these are in. But it's not just my company and our old legacy code. Just recently, there was a nice Raycaster put up on Reddit. Um, there's a whole Raycaster done in like 200 lines or something like that. Um, it has this nice VEC3F class, which represents both points and vectors. And I should thank uh, Dmitry Sokolov for this example here. Here, orange is a point in 3D space, and dir is a direction. And the return value is also a VEC3F, and it represents a color, because a color is just three floats. So that means you could add a color to a location and subtract that from a direction and get an answer. Yeah. So I wrote a helper library. This allows us to define our own spaces as types. It has distinct types for points and vectors, and these are templated based on the coordinate space that they're in. So obviously I work in medical imaging, so we have spaces relative to the patient, the viewing plane, et cetera, that kind of thing. This meaningless broken object now no longer compiles. So again, the compiler is catching bugs for us before they can possibly go live. The norm, the cross, dot functions, these don't exist for points. And if we subtract one point from another, we get a vector in the same space. If we add a vector to a point, we get another point. It makes everything much more understandable. Points and vectors both have templated convert to methods, but now points will be transformed, taking the translation into account, whereas vectors will be correctly transformed without the translation. I also created strong types for the units in the various spaces. So if you ask for the magnitude of a vector in patient space, you get an answer in millimeters. But if you ask for the magnitude of a vector in view space, you get an answer in pixels. Oh, and I put in overloads as well for the error cases that don't compile with nice static asserts. I don't know if you've used many templates, but uh, when they go wrong, they tend to go very badly wrong. So with my library, you get nice errors like this. So not only do you get compile time errors, you get understandable compile time errors. OK, that's me mostly done. Um, I'm going to go over some of the points I've covered in this talk and bring a few conclusions together. But first, I just want to go back to that Mars Climate uh, Orbiter. NASA gave detailed documentation to Lockheed Martin, specifying the desired behavior. 
This here is a quote from the, uh, the Mishap Investigation Board Phase 1 report, November 10th, 1999. It's great reading. Um, it makes it quite clear that the software inter interface specification was not followed. And that does not surprise me. I don't know if you've worked on projects with detailed specifications, but it's a really, really bad way to try and build in quality. It's really, really easy for people to forget to look at the documentation, especially when the way forward is obvious, or it seems obvious. And documentation is tedious, so no one goes out of their way to read it. So if you want something enforced, enforce it by design, not by documentation. There's a quote from Peter Drucker, um, which is very popular in the Agile movement, which is, culture eats strategy for breakfast. In this case, Lockheed Martin had a culture of using imperial units. The strategy was described in great detail in a document, and culture won. Culture will always win, unless we can automate against it. OK. I talked about types at the start of the talk, but maybe the understanding of them has changed a little bit now. Types add meaning. They don't just group data together. They don't just specify a layout of data in memory. They are a high-level language feature that adds semantic value to our code base. Well-defined types allow us to understand our own code better as we create it. Well-defined types allow others to understand our code better. And that other person might be us in a few weeks or months. So by encoding meaning in the code, we encode our intent and our thinking <coughs> behind the code. And this is far better than any comments or documentation. And one reason it's stronger is because the compiler can understand the types and check them. Comments and documentation can get out of date with respect to the code. But the types are part of that code itself. And every bit of code that doesn't compile is one less test case or defect report. We should always make our APIs easy to use well and difficult to use badly. If we rely on base types like int and float, then we risk them being used incorrectly. And we force the reader to dig deeper into what the API means rather than focusing on solving their own problem. Strong types tell us what something is and not how it's implemented. We don't need to know that a kilogram is stored as a double precision floating point number. That's an implementation detail and should be hidden away. We can write code that's closer to the problem domain. This means that we are constantly thinking about kilograms or meters per second, etc., instead of doubles. So we are thinking of the problem at a higher level. And we are using the same kind of language that an end user of our software would use. And this can help to build empathy with our end users. With a well-written library, we can easily create strong types. With the example we saw, we can create them in a single line and get all of those benefits that strong types bring. So yes, there's some complicated code in that library, but it's wrapped away. And even better, other people have already written these libraries for us. So that's basically me finished now. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, I couldn't have done it without shamelessly ripping off code from Jonathan Bakara. Um, almost everything in this talk uh, was, I'm going to say, inspired, if not just outright stolen from him. Um, these are the links here to his blog and GitHub. His blog in particular is very good. And uh, Jonathan Muller, who I don't think he's in the room, but he's at the conference, certainly, has also blogged about this and also has a very nice library for strong types on GitHub. And that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Do I have any strategies for combining units together like kilogram seconds? Um, yes. You need to define other operators uh, externally that are specific for those, though. 
So you need to know that the kilogram times a kilogram is a kilogram squared, it's a new type. So you have to write those more as bespoke things. I haven't found a way of making that generic. Right. The boost units do all. Oh, okay, that provides all the standard units, does it? Yeah. Yeah. But I guess if they. Mm -hmm. just can't like add or subtract two units of different types. Right. But I guess there's a more generic problem that you may have a bespoke domain in which you're not yeah. using the boost units, but yeah. yeah. Yes? First of all, thank you for raising awareness of strong types. <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you for mentioning a stood ratio, because I'm the one who got it from the standard library. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was invented specifically for this kind of problem. Um, the, area, the, the notion of units has been a solved problem for 20 years, mm -hmm. but I can't get into the standard library. I've tried four, five, six times. Um, there are powerful people who don't like strong typing, don't like um, uh, strong type depth, let's call it, mm. in the standard political problem, not a technical problem. I'm aware of that, problem. yes. Um, but I would just like to point out that I believe the approach that you have shown for units is suboptimal. Units are not types, they're values. Mass is a type. Length is a type. Length can be expressed in many different units. I should be able to add them together and I get a length. Mm -hmm. The approach that I see here runs into trouble of a kind that, is, that has been called the return type problem. Just think about house numbers. House numbers are not addable. Mm -hmm. But on a street where the numbers are consecutive, they are subtractable. But if you subtract two house numbers, you don't get a house number. You get a different type. Indeed. Right? And my house number minus your house number is meaningless if it's not on the same street. Right? And if I multiply a length times a length, I don't want a length, I want an area. If mm -hmm. I multiply an area times a length, I want a volume. And those should all be different types. <coughs> and I believe the approach illustrated here does not solve the general case. I agree. Uh, so, so I just wanted to point that out. I mean, there are other software packages that do, including mine, which is running on Mars, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's a reason why I wrote the, the vector and point thing myself, because right. like a point, um, adding a vector gives you a, a, another point. You, you have to know that. Thank but you Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, that one first. So we, we work in the YouTube campaign, and so we see time as part of time, and we need to put it into a from each other, and we have a two million line code base that has this from each from each time. Now we have a library for a writing that is from each time. Mm -hmm. Um, have you had to do something like that for the experience? No, we've in introduced them on an incremental scale. But on, on, in new code or in new in code? In new code. And as we've modified old code, we've added it in as we've went. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. All the resharper guys are just out there. <laughs> Dot get and construct as a boundary, where it's all, where you have the interface with old code that still uses explicit bubbles. Uh, when you need to send a strong type to that, to a dot get, you send mm. it in a yeah. thing. And then yes. when you get it back, trust the API that it gives back what it says it does, and construct that from type and get back the state line. Yeah, that's basically, the, that's basically the strangler pattern being advocated for. When Slowly strangle your old code with the, the new wrapper. So did you have a question, Steph? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, just saying that for me, personally, the, uh, the example of the vector and points, and especially with different, be, them being in different spaces and them, them actually being different types is like the killer feature for strong type, like the killer use for strong type mm -hmm. for me because I've dealt with graphic stuff. Uh, we had to build a 3D engine, a like renderer uh, in university using C plus 98. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know 
growing up by templates like that, to be able to start thinking about building something like this, like that would have relieved so much pain of debugging. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. So I, I really like all of this stuff and more of it. Um, so I was wondering <laughs> if you uh, experiment a lot with sort of going beyond sort of the use case for units of strong types. Because uh, I, I guess sort of the generalization here is that you're using types to formalize and encode assumptions about your values. Mm -hmm. so like a type is a proof that the value sort of corresponds to a certain trait. And so if you, if you sort of you go mm -hmm. further on that, you can even say like, oh, this function, like it takes like two integers, but this one's supposed to be bigger than this one, or this one's supposed to be all, this one's supposed to be even. And well, uh, this approach is very useful. I think the, the skills mm -hmm. uh, I've got is very good there. It, like it, can, you get to add a lot of functionality without a lot of boilerplate. Yeah. I feel like for the more sophisticated constraints, you do end up needing more boilerplate, and it becomes ugly. And at that point, sort of it starts to topple in some ways. I haven't room, I guess, for, to go further. So I haven't tried to solve that exact problem, but I would imagine that if you can identify your particular domain problem you're trying to solve, um, then you probably could extract that away into you know non-boilerplate library code. But I haven't tried to do that now. Yeah, sorry. So Jonathan Muller's done this in his library. Um, he has like a strong int or something like that, where you can say this int can only be between like five and ten, um, and he does it with a mixture of compile time checking. Like if you pass in seven, no, well, you know it's okay. If you pass in twelve, it just doesn't compile, um, and then runtime checking, where if you receive a valid runtime, it maybe throws or whatever. You're the strong type that we just chewed out. It's very similar, I would say, in a sense to Chroma, the, mm -hmm. the library. Yep. Is, is it, there is no plan like to, to combine all of those to create like because we are representing a class of real time of uh, you know real objects. Mm -hmm. So to speak, uh, would it be then sensible to maybe follow your that this idea and try to be represent all the types? Is that you know the the, the examples that you gave like real life examples? Mm -hmm. They are fantastic because, like, you know, when you said it was like to be recommended, why didn't we think about that? There are at least three papers for, put forward to the committee to put strong types into the language as Snowballs has left. But as he pointed out, this has been pushed and it has not got traction with the committee. I'm not aware of why not. Yeah. Sorry? Ah. Performance, yes, it does. Um, and I have strong opinions about this. Um, so I've done some benchmarking. Um, I tried adding up like, I don't know, 20 billion doubles and then 20 billion kilograms. Um, and it took about two and a half times longer to do the kilograms. Um, but certainly in the code where I've used this, it has not been in code that needed to be highly optimized. Uh, it was in code that was happening, for example, when the user clicked a button. Uh, and it was then going to kick off an algorithm that took maybe 30 seconds to run. So the fact that putting a double into a wrapper and then taking it out again, maybe added on a couple of microseconds, was not relevant. And the benefits of having code that we knew worked was much, much higher. So yes, it does have a penalty, but you want to be careful what you optimize. I think C++ suffers a lot from people over-optimizing things at a local level. Isn't it basically the same with C++? This is slower, but correct at the same time. Am I correct? That would certainly be a good thing to advocate for, yes. You know, if you increase the light of the rotation for a couple of, you know, uh, the, the increases of the light, rather than if you stretch the passion by a few couple of centimeters, mm -hmm. that would have a more desired effect. Yep. <coughs> yes. And the significant uh, impact on compile time. Uh, not that I've noticed, but I'd imagine there would be. Um, it certainly is doing more work. But, yeah, I've not measured that one, sorry. Hmm, interesting. Um, we just used it because we were using strong types with the two doubles. We figured it would make a lot of sense to also strongly type the Boolean, mainly so that we have APIs that literally told you what to pass in, um, whether it's enabled or not. Um, so, you, know, you could, yeah. 
give a very similar result. I'm not sure I can really choose between them. Anyone else? Yes, at the back. Yeah. I haven't looked at that actually, no. Um, I would hazard a guess it's just because we're putting, you know, calling functions to get a double rather than just simply accessing it straight away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did have a go at trying to force it to be more in line and didn't get much performance improvement. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you very much. <laughs>